Welcome, everyone. Our prep meeting for this week is Scott Bullock with Emergency Dental Preparation. I won't even try and go in. You're going to mention your own credentials, I think, at the front. I'll, I'll go through that. Yeah. The, the 30, 40 years of, <laughs> of work. <laughs> no, and so thank you very much for coming. We'll start with Russ helping us with an opening prayer, and we'll get rolling. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful to be here with Scott tonight and have this opportunity to learn about emergency dentistry and the tips and direction he's going to give us. We pray that thou bless him by spirit and all those that are listening tonight or will in the future that we'll be able to gain from this and be able to, if necessary, apply it in their lives and in times ahead of us. We say these things in our dear Savior's name, even Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. Well, is I'll go through some of the credentials and things like that in just a minute. But uh, first, I just wanted to see if uh, who uh, understands the, <laughs> the the reference pictures here. So, if these don't mean anything to you, it means you need to go home and watch the movie Castaway, because in that movie with Tom Hanks. Uh, he, it's, it's actually a, a pretty realistic portrayal of a significant dental emergency in, under circumstances of no availability. So in this movie, then, uh, then Tom Hanks is a, he's a, a FedEx manager and he ends up in, ends up on a deserted island. And just before he gets on the plane, he starts complaining a little bit about this tooth that that he just had a root canal in a, a not too long ago and it's kind of bugging a little bit he, he's going to have to get that looked at when he gets back well he doesn't get back until i don't know four or five years or whatever it is but in the process he starts to develop this this toothache that turns into a big abscess it's getting swollen it's getting extremely painful and he knows he's in trouble he knows he's in real trouble. And so he looks at what he has available. And he had a few of these uh, FedEx boxes that had washed ashore. And uh, one of them had a set of ice skates. And then, of course, there were rocks. And so that was, that was his tool of choice to remove this tooth. Uh, under a uh, life and death situation. So I thought, you know, dental prep, that's, that's probably appropriate. So we really want to be able to do better than this. So, but it did come down to, you know, ingenuity and what you, what you have the availability to do. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. All right. Okay. So a little bit about uh, qualifications and bias. I am an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Um, I've been practicing here in St. George for, I don't know, 26, 27 years. Um, as an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, I'm the end of the referral line in dental. All the dental disasters, the big infections, the everything falling apart needs to be fixed. Things that cannot be fixed in an easy dental way come to me. I deal with the, the staff flesh eating infections. I deal with the, uh, I've seen uh, abscesses that have gone to patients' brains. I've seen abscesses that have spread to the heart. Um, they can get pretty, pretty significant uh, pretty quickly. Fortunately, that's the huge exception. Most of the time, they're not nearly as life-threatening, um, but they definitely can be. We have the benefit of care, of dental and medical care, pretty much at our fingertips. Um, even still, sometimes it gets pretty interesting. Uh, just one example, I had a, a young man in his 20s that called on a Monday and said, I went into my dentist and he says, I need to have this tooth taken out. 
when can I get in? And they, they said, well, we've got an opening on Monday morning or Wednesday morning. Can you come in then? And he said, sure, I'll, I'll come in on Wednesday. Didn't say anything about it hurting or swelling or giving him any trouble at all. And so he, he showed up Wednesday morning, standing forward so he could breathe, neck about this big, uh, spitting toss into a cup because he couldn't swallow. And so I immediately said, cancel my day, we are going to surgery. And so I sent him straight over to the emergency department and I headed over, I called the operating room and I said, I've got a patient with full-blown Ludwig's angina. Ludwig's angina is when you have big swelling that goes to the other side and basically is surrounding your airway. And so the nurse says, well, we are really busy today. It's probably gonna be about four o'clock before we can get him in. And so rather than try and argue the point, I just said, go get an anesthesiologist and tell them that I have a full-blown Ludwig's angina patient who is, um, who is having to sit forward to breathe and spitting pus into a cup. And she came back to bring him straight up from the ER. We're setting up a room for him right now. And this is a young, healthy, 20 some odd year old kid otherwise. And I asked him, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you come in sooner? He said, well, my point was on Wednesday morning. So, you know, so we get him into the OR, the anesthesiologist uh, was, he could barely, barely get a tube in him awake. They couldn't put him to sleep. Uh, we had a trach team there, but that's extremely difficult given the fact, you know, that where the infection is. Um, the, the anesthesiologist said this was the, the closest that he had ever been to losing a patient on the table uh, under, under those circumstances. And, and, you know, we drained it. He did fine, but but had his appointment been Thursday morning, he would not have survived the night. And that's there. There are several in that category. The key is recognizing what's happening and knowing what to do about it. Um, I deal with abscesses and infections almost every day. Uh, really bad infections, uh, fortunately not that often, but generally a few a month at least. So, so as far as an oral surgeon, that's the qualifications. Probably my biggest qualification though, um, even far beyond uh, the oral surgery is the fact that I've been uh, providing dental treatment in Haiti, uh, actually not just in Haiti, but in the, the, the back country of Haiti in the, the rural areas f since 2002. Uh, I've seen it long before the earthquake, right before, right after, and, and, uh, and since then. And just to kind of give you a little bit of background there, so you kind of know what, um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Haiti. Honestly, to take a little, to, to uh, a lecture on Haiti, and the experiences there, the orphanages, we started out uh, adopting. Well, we started out trying to build an orphanage. There was, a, we, we found out about a gentleman who uh, was a, a Haitian LDS bishop in, in Haiti who was employed. Uh, Haiti has about an 80% unemployment rate. And for those who are employed, the average income is $500 a year. And um, we went to Uganda where the average income is $300 a year, but you can buy a lot more in Uganda for $300 than you can in Haiti for five. Anyway, so we started trying to get an orphanage built for this gentleman who had his three children and 40 other children in a 650 square foot house. Um, take some imagination to figure out how you even do that. No such thing as beds or anything like that. It's your stuff where you can be. And so anyway, that was the project. And we ended up getting pulled into, we were already adopting kids from Guatemala. We ended up, we just couldn't help it. We you know, got pulled into to the, the adoptions there. Um, when I first, when we first went down to visit our kids, they wanted me to take care of, you know, the dental needs and things at the, at the orphanage and at the school. And so I took some basic supplies down and the kids some, you know, basic cleanings and, and maybe a, a baby tooth here and there. And I thought, you know, 
patients have. And it, after a few trips down there, same thing. And I go to the school and same thing. And I thought, wow, patients just, they have great teeth. And, and I thought, you know, this, this, is, this is pretty easy. Well, then a few years later, I was contacted by a lady named, uh, named Annie Blackstone who had, was working with the orphanage and started her own organization, building schools. She was, uh, she was an adopted mom, an adopting mom who really, who he would have children dropped off at his house all the time. He didn't start out wanting to run an orphanage. He just had work and had food. And so people would bring their kids to him. And, and some of these kids were from all different areas of the country. And he would have to go back and find the parents so that he could get permission to adopt these kids out. And as he would go to these different villages that were way out in the, in the country, then people would hear of him. He would literally park, he'd go in and talk to the family and he would come back and his car is full of children. And these are all children that are dying. These are children that are going to die very soon if they're not taken care of. And so the parents are giving them up to save their lives. And so he would go to get information on one child and he'd come back with five or six. And then he'd, you know, get them nursed back to health and then he'd, you know, try to try to adopt them out. And so, so much of that was happening that Annie wanted to find a way to keep the children with the families. And so, so the organization started building schools. And so that's, so then I was asked to go with them to these schools and treat the children in the surrounding areas. So first trip. Uh, there's, there's me for, I am the dental group by myself. And there was, um, uh, I think one, one, uh, physician and we had a couple of nurses and I thought, okay, we're going to a school. So I'm going to be seeing mostly kids and I know Haitians have great teeth because they don't have sugar. And so, you know, it's probably going to be pretty, pretty easy. So I put in a few instruments and a bunch of stuff for a whole bunch of toothbrushes and things like that, because um, most of these kids had never seen a toothbrush. They had no idea what it was. And so, you know, we took a whole bunch of those things. And when we got there, I realized that what I was seeing was a very, very unique situation around the orphanage that once we got out, about the only food that these children had was sugarcane that grew naturally. And so it went from this is going to be easy to all of a sudden I've got to figure out with no electricity, no chair, a headlight, a handful of instruments, no x-ray equipment, no assistant, you know, um, how to provide actually very, very challenging uh, dental treatment. Um, some big infections. I had a young kid about uh, 12 that had broken a tooth off and he was starting to swell getting down into his neck. And I've got to figure out how to get this tooth out with no drills, no electricity, nothing. Um, we had a room with a window, which a window means a hole in the wall. It does, there's nothing in it and a high back chair. That's it. So we could tip him back so he's kind of sitting sort of in the window. And of course, I've got a, a large group of people watching everything we're doing. And under those circumstances, I've got to get this tooth out that I know is going to kill him if we don't get it out. Uh, and, and so it went from thinking this is going to be an easy deal to hundreds of patients waiting in line all day and just working as fast as they can. We had one person, which all they did was sterilize instruments all day long over a fire with, with you know, boiling them. And so I learned really quickly what it means to try to do dentistry under the very worst conditions really on the planet. Um, so anyway, so uh, we'll talk about some of those experiences. And, and so, as I said, I don't really have time to I mean, the, the, the experiences, the miracles, the so many things in Haiti that were, were wonderful. Um, but I'll touch on a little bit because, like I say, that's probably more, more interesting than most of the things we're going over. As far as bias, 
Uh, I am an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. I am, obviously I'm dental trained. I don't do any general dentistry. As a specialist, I ethically cannot do general dentistry. I don't do fillings, I don't do crowns. And so as we're talking about any of those kinds of things, I do not have a dog in that fight. It's not my, you know, we're gonna talk about some of the controversies and some of the options and things. Um, I do jaw and face surgeries. I do a lot of wisdom teeth and I do a lot of implants. That's kind of the main thing. So if I'm talking about those things, there's, you know, I'm sure some level of bias. As far as the other, it would be bias of the level of my training. So, okay. All right. Haiti. Haiti is amazingly beautiful. It is a beautiful country. Um, go ahead and go to the next one. Green, really humid, really sticky. Um, wonderful, beautiful place. Pristine beaches with nobody on them. Gorgeous, gorgeous country. Okay, go ahead. And incredible poverty. Poverty of the type that does not exist in the US. They have no programs. They have no safety net. Um, uh, they, and I'll, I'll, I'll point out a few of the things that their limitations. They, the places that we were going, so, when Annie started deciding she was building schools, she went outside of Port-au-Prince to the places where Gesno was picking up the most children from, the places where the most children were starving to death. And she figured if she can get a school, she can, the children can be educated and they can be fed at school. And generally that's the only meal that they ever get. And so that's what, that was, was uh, her goal. Um, to this, at, at this stage, I think they've started uh, five or six schools. Uh, four of those have been, have, are, uh, are fully funded and, and run by organizations that have, have taken those over. And so that then frees her up to then find another location and build another school. Uh, they just opened one recently which has had to be closed down because of the, the violence there. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, about that. But these, this, this type of house, this, this is common. Um, these, the, the kind of tin, tin sheds. Okay, let's go ahead. Uh, no bathrooms, pretty much nobody. I mean, even in Port-au-Prince, you want to find a bathroom, they're going to have to, they'll, they'll say, well, down a block or whatever. Uh, the bathrooms are the bushes, wherever you are. That's, that's how it is every place. Uh, this is a very typical laundry. What this is, this is, a, this is a quarry. They do all the quarrying by hand. They climb up the side of these, these cliffs with ropes and they chisel the rocks off all around them which is obviously kind of, kind of spooky. They fall down, they put them into wagons or sometimes they'll have some trucks and that's, that's where that goes. Go ahead. Okay, wonderful people, beautiful people. These, these are kids actually, so one of the places that we go, well, several of the places we go, we have to hike into. And so when I take somebody with me, I tell them, they say, well, what do I take? You're going to take what you can put in a backpack. That's what you have to work with. Your equipment is what you can put in a backpack or in a bag, and you, we can carry it to this place. And so this, the, the school that these kids are at, it's about two miles up, brutal, brutal climb up on a, on a hilltop. And so the kids all came down to help us carry some of our, our stuff up. So, okay, go ahead. All right, this is a typical classroom, a uh, dirt floor, uh, you can see you can't pack too many more kids in there. And these, I want you to want to point out this school bench, because this school bench is going to be very significant uh, as we move ahead in how, how dentistry is done in these, in these areas. So I want to tell you a little bit about some of these, some of these kids. Uh, so the kids that are in the schools vary from about five to up around 15 or 16 when they go to secondary and and we've supported some supported kids from there all the way up now i mean since we've been doing this long enough we've had kids go through nursing we've got kids that have 
uh, we've got uh, people from the, the, the organization that supported that have been through dental school, through medical school. So we've got physicians there, we've got dentists there, we've got nurses there. Um, some of which were these kids that have worked their way up through the, through the, the stages. The really incredible thing about it is that these kids, almost every one of these kids, are the first person in their entire history that knows how to write or, or uh, read or even write their name. When we go into these places, these people, they, they can't write their name. Most of these kids, when we first started going, they had, when that first trip where it was way out, they, they'd never seen a white person before. In fact, a lot of the most, not only the kids, but most of their families had never seen a white person before. They, a lot of these kids and even some of their families didn't even know that people outside of their walkable realm even existed. So, so these are the first kids in not only generations, but ever that can read, can write, that know what the, the world is, know what's out there that know that there are other people, that know that those people are willing to come and, and, and help. And you think about how powerful that is because some of these kids now are adults. You know, maybe not, these, this is maybe a little more recent, but I mean, going there for this long, a lot of these kids are adults now. And so that's driving a level of change that hasn't been seen ever in, in some of these countries. So really a, a, a cool experience. Some of these kids now on this one, I showed you the the um, the quarry, and this is up on a hilltop, and I'll I'll show you. It's 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 a brutal hike to get up there, especially carrying a bunch of instruments. And a lot of these kids live on other hilltops, and so these little five and six year olds will leave their houses in the dark at four o'clock in the morning, you know, or five o'clock in the morning, and they'll walk for two hours or more down their hillsides across that quarry and up this, this climb that was kicking our butts getting up there. And they do that every day, every day. And that's, they, they do that because their, their parents understand at least a little bit, um, but the, the kids want to learn and they want to go where other kids are and they get fed. And that's that, that one meal in the day when all, the only other thing they're getting is uh, just stuff that they can scrounge off of the ground or uh, a little bit of sugar cane is, is, is to them is worth the trip. So these kids, and they're, it's amazing how clean they are. They, they value everything. They've got one pair of clothes and that is always clean because it's, it's, all, they, it's all they have. So anyway, wonderful, wonderful experience. Okay. Okay, so this shows another, another class, uh, a little bit older. Again, the school bench. The reason that that's important, well, go ahead and go, go to the next one. So beautiful kids, just fun, just wonderful. So this is the trail, uh, and, and it's about two, between two and three miles of that kind of hike. And, and it's, it's hot and it's sticky, and we get to the top and we're, all red faced and all these these little kids are just laughing at us they've never seen anybody that looks like us <laughs> this person looks like a tomato yeah i do after i just hiked up this thing okay go on to the next and you can see they carry it they'll just walk right up there with the stuff on their heads okay so here's more of the more of the trip um if we're lucky, sometimes we're able to, to make arrangements and have a, a donkey that would at least help carry some of our stuff up, especially later when we're able to do more things. Okay, right. okay. so this is, this is one of the schools. And typical thing, we get there that morning and there are hundreds of people lined up waiting to, waiting to be seen. Um, these are people that have no access. They're not close enough to the city to get there. They have no availability. And so in most cases, these are people that have never been seen. Uh, you know, the first time we go, we go to the, so some of the, the main schools we go to every time, at least once a year and uh, twice a year if we can. And then the, then uh, uh, we generally will throw in another couple of schools 
that are not part of our system just to, to get out and see other people. And it gets to where there's a big difference. We can see a big difference between those that are getting some care and those that have never had care. And, and in these situations, these kids, even the kids, and we're not just seeing kids, we're seeing adults of all ages and all of the community. And, and it's, a, it's a really, really busy time. But even these kids that are scared to death, they hear this white person, they've never seen a white person, and he's going to do things to them that they just know is just going to be awful, but they're going to wait there in line all day because they hurt all the time, and they, they want to get those teeth out. And there have been, I mean, some of the time I'm taking every single molar out in a 12-year-old because there is nothing salvageable. And these are teeth that are going to hurt them until they either finally come out or they kill them. And so uh, it, it's, it, so it started out basically dentistry of desperation is really kind of what it, what it started as. Lots of people and uh, lots of work, lots of problems. Okay, go ahead. This shows another one of the, one of the schools. This is, what we're, this is what we see. When the day we pull up and every day after that is, you know, as long as we're there, is just people lined up, they stand there all day uh, to see a doctor and see a dentist. Go ahead. Okay, this one, I'm gonna talk about this one for just a second because it kind of puts things in perspective. I, I've, I've been in Haiti several times and I've got to admit, I did not understand the, the circumstances. I, I've taken a few people with me that said, well, why are we traveling so much? We could set up a clinic in Port-au-Prince and we could see people all day long. We're, we're wasting time traveling. But in Port-au-Prince, there are other people there. In these places, there's nobody. No, this was, this was an area where there had never been a dental or medical team that had gotten there. It took us, took us hours to drive and it was about a five mile hike to get to this school. And we, there was a miscommunication. We, we, uh, Annie had talked to the mayor and said, we'll be there. We're going to provide free work. Um, can you have something there for us since we're going, so we're traveling so far, can we have something for lunch? We'd be fine with bread. We'd literally, we'd be fine with nothing, but that's what was said. So the, the mayor then sent out information that we were going to be there, but that everybody in order to pay for our lunch needed to contribute 10 goods. And, and 10 goods is the equivalent of 25 cents. And when we got there, there were the kids and nobody, nobody from the community, nobody, no matter how desperate they were, had 25 cents to be able to pay to, to be seen. And so obviously, you know, so we sent runners out to tell everybody, forget about, you know, that, that wasn't our idea. We know there is no requirement to show up, but it gives you an idea of the level of poverty that these people are in and the, the, the complete lack of availability to any type of care. And so, you know, as, as we look at these kinds of things, we say, okay, how bad could it get? However bad it gets, it's not going to be worse than this. Let's go, on. go to the next. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, dental dental treatment. This is the back of the one of those school benches. The only piece of furniture that we could count on being at every school was this bench. They, they always made them. They always had them. Uh, often we had no other chairs. We had no other tables. We may not have anything at all except dirt floors and what we carry up, but we had these benches. And so we had to learn how to do dentistry on a, on a school bench. Okay, go ahead. And kneeling next to the what? Oh, you'll, you'll see, yeah, it's okay. okay. So, so this is one of the later trips. This is one where, this is Dr. Stevens, uh, David Stevens, and he's bring, he brought a bunch of, of dental equipment. You can see this is an electrical drill um, and and because we were able to carry electricity, and I'll show you, I'll show you what we use for that. Um, I, I don't use electricity there. Uh, I've gone for so long with absolutely nothing that there just isn't anything electrical that I need. Um, now we only had one chair. This was the principal's chair, and that was it. 
And so he got the chair. And so, so this, so I'm sitting on the bench with the patient's head in my lap doing surgery. That was the, you know, you make do with what you have. No table, but we had a school bench. And we had, you know, we, we sterilized and we did, you know, but, but uh, very, very limited availability. Basically we had what we had. Um, these are some of the Haitians that, that are there. The organization is primarily Haitian run. And these, these uh, young people are fantastic. They're, um, most of these are, so part of what Gesno did is he taught English. And uh, a lot of these kids were his young men, young women group that he would teach them English for free um, if they would come. And then he had other people that he, you know, that would pay him to teach English. And so they would be our translators and our security and our people movers and all of that. So a wonderful, wonderful people, a lot of fun. Okay, go ahead. All right, this is, this was the biggest improvement that we came up with. So at first we tried to use a generator, but for a generator, you've got to, you've got to carry gas. The thing is heavy. It's, how are you going to get that up that, you know, that uh, two mile hike? And it was just awful. And then you're running it and where, you know, it just, it just didn't work. I had to learn how to do everything without electricity. And then goal zero came out with a, a battery pack. It was about this big, it weighed about 30 pounds. And that was the greatest thing I'd ever seen. And so we lugged that thing around for a while. It's a it's a, a solar generator, so we put out solar panels. Then iNergy came out with this one, lithium. It weighs about five pounds. You can see it's about, about as tall as my toothbrush. It's about that wide. I can stick it in my carry-on and we'd hook up. So we'd charge it at the, at the hotel at night and we could hook it up to uh, some portable uh, uh, solar panels during the day while we're using it. So it's charging and being used at the same time. And we would run all of our dental equipment, all of the stuff to, so that this is what made it possible for us to, for me to bring dentists that could do fillings and things like that. Other than that, it's just extractions. I mean, no electricity, no fillings, you know, it's basically that simple. And so, so this allowed us to expand and start to do treat, you know, do dental treatment rather than, than just, just taking out infected teeth. Um, still, there was plenty of people to see just taking out infected teeth all day long, but it was really nice to be able to do more. Um, unfortunately, they don't make these little ones anymore. They do make some bigger ones that are pretty nice, but these little ones, that was just, that's, I've still got it. It still works. It's one of the most awesome little things I've ever had. So pretty, pretty, pretty cool. All right. Uh, we often work late getting dark or there, you know, our headlights, you can see there's the window with no glass, you know, it's just a hole in the wall, dirt floors. And we still, here it's looking like this. And we still have, I don't know how many patients still waiting outline, you know, outside trying to be, trying to be seen, so. Okay, uh, this is my son, Brandon. Uh, you can see, you know, we've got everything set up sterile. We do have all the gloves and, you know, because we take, we take it, we have what we, what we take and, uh, and sterilization fluids and things like that. So um, he's spending most of, most of his time scrubbing instruments. Go ahead. And this is Bryce. Uh, he's uh, just finished his first year in dental school. This is when this has been a while. Uh, after a long day, not feeling well, because you can catch all kinds of stomach stuff, as you can imagine, in Haiti, and, <clears throat> and just exhausted, long, hard, busy days, tons of, of uh, toothbrushes. Again, most of these kids had never seen a toothbrush, and their family had never seen one. They'd, we'd had, we had to show them what they're for, what, what, what we do with them. So that's a tiny little piece of the, you know, I mean, the, we haven't even... In the orphanages and the whole it's it's a it's a very very different lifestyle but as you can imagine so as i'm talking about experiences with dentistry in um in difficult conditions that's what, that's what i'm talking about so okay any questions okay it's fine 
All right, so in Haiti, this is what we see all the time, is the progression of the cavity. So you start out with a tooth that's okay, then it gets a little, uh, starts to get a cavity. In here, it may be a little bit sensitive, maybe you'll notice a little hot and cold, but generally not much. Here, now you, you eat something cold or something, you know, sweet or whatever. Now it's, it's going to let you know that it's, that it's there. Um, here, here it starts to hurt and it starts to hurt bad and it's going to hurt pretty much continuously until the nerve completely dies. And then here it's gone all the way through. So now you're looking and sorry, this didn't, this part of this didn't, didn't show up very well, but now this is when you're looking at a big hole and sometimes at this point it will stop hurting and, and uh, it, because the nerve is completely dead. But at this point, any of these times, this here or here, they can start to form an abscess and, and, and that abscess can relieve the pressure. And as it relieves the pressure, then the pain goes away. And at that point, they think they're doing okay. But that's when it's really getting dangerous because that's when the infection is, is spreading. The reason that what makes a tooth hurt is it's building up pressure underneath it at the tip and, and it's, it's pushing on that tooth. And so if something releases that pressure, then the pain often will go away. And so people will say, yeah, this tooth was bothering me for a while, but it's gone away. It's not better. It's, it's just releasing that pressure. Now, as this happens, it decays down into the center of the tooth. And hopefully if they're fortunate and, and most of the time, I mean, people survive this, it's miserable. It can be miserable for years, but, but if it can drain up through the tooth or around the tooth, then it will stop hurting and little by little, the body will just start to push that tooth out. Okay? And, they, and they, they do fine. It's a long, miserable process, but the tooth eventually will just come out on its own. The, the body starts to treat it just like a sliver. If it doesn't though, then they get a big infection that finds another place to go, which can be the brain, the neck, the heart, wherever. And so that's where it really gets dangerous. Okay, going to the next one. Okay, so this is a patient here, obviously. No implants in Haiti, um, but, but it illustrates so this is, a, this is a person that had exactly this process happen here, okay, where it started to, to decay and then it got bigger and it hurt for a while and then it, the pressure released and it started to do okay. And so over here, you can actually see a fat, faint outline of where the roots used to be. And slowly they've, they've just been pushed up and this is filled in with good, healthy bone. It's draining around it. So yeah, it hurts a little bit. The gums are sore, but it's not going anywhere bad. And eventually this tooth would just fall out on its own. Now here we have a different situation. This tooth has had a root canal. It can't drain up through here. And so this tooth is not moving up. Instead, the infection is going down. And the feeling nerve to her lower lip is right here and it's getting really close and it's starting to get really painful and she's getting swelling. And this tooth very easily could become life-threatening whereas this one was just miserable, okay? So, so this, the, the natural progression of a tooth and how the body manages that in order to, to, to maintain life in this person is really quite remarkable. I would see teeth like this all day long. There. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, what we have is we take that ugly hole and we stuff it with something else. Okay, now, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying don't get your teeth taken care of. In fact, just the opposite. But the reality is we're changing the natural process for these teeth, however bad it is. We're creating a cap, a top that, 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 that the decay cannot work through. And so the infection cannot drain through. And so these teeth, there's pretty much not, there's not really much chance at all 
that if that abscess is that that abscess is going to be able to drain through the tooth, it's going to have to drain around it. Now, we look at these and we say, oh, those are pretty ugly. This looks really pretty. These are just as dangerous as these. These are just prettier. Okay, this is still, it's, it's still uh, composite filling. It's still not going to allow that tooth to drain. Now, it's better to do this than it is to, to leave it. But in, a, in, in Haiti, in a, in a non-care availability situation, you have to rethink all of this because sure we would all choose this. That looks really pretty. This looks really ugly. We're going to talk more about this later on, but just so, but the reality is these tooth colored fillings often will irritate the nerve more. They, they leak more. And so when I take a dentist down, and I explained to them, okay, you're going to be doing fillings here. You cannot, no heroics. You cannot put a filling in that's close to the nerve. Okay. A deep filling that, hey, we'll see if this is going to be okay. Here, they say, hey, it's kind of close to the nerve, but I think it'll be okay. We'll see how you do. If not, we'll, we'll send you over and have you get a root canal. There is no send you over to get a root canal. It's, I think we can fix this. If we can't and we top it and this goes bad, it will not be able to drain and we have just increased their potential of dying from this many, many, many times. And so we take on a whole, we have to take on an entirely different view of this situation. We cannot create a bigger problem than they have. We can't take a situation that they have maybe a 75% chance of surviving and give them a, a situation that they have a 10% chance of surviving. So, so we have to be very careful. What's that? If, if there's any question, absolutely. They have no backup. They have no safety net. And so if it's a deep cavity, if, if, if there's any possibility that this is getting close to the nerve, the tooth comes out. This is not a place for dental heroics. These require a lot of electricity. You've, you've got to have suction. It's got to be dry. You've got to have an air water syringe. We have none of that up there. This can be put in under any condition, any place. Okay. Now these look terrible, but that's the slide. We'll talk about that. But yeah, so, so in a Haiti situation, most of the time you're going to do amalgam fillings not composite fillings because the chances of these leaking and only lasting them a couple of years and then getting a cavity underneath them is far, far higher, partially because of just the nature of the material, but also because of the difficulty of performing this type of dental work and, and the conditions that are required there. And so again, what, in, in what your choices are have to reflect what your availability and what your conditions are. And so the type of, of procedures that we can do, well, they'll do composites on the front teeth because those are easy to take care of if you have to. It's the back teeth. We were very, very hesitant to do something like this, as pretty as it is, in Haiti, because if that goes bad, there's nobody there that's going to take care of it for them. So, so you can see the, the, the decision process becomes very different. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so these are some that are going bad. Here you've got a crack in the tooth. You're starting a big abscess starting to show up here. Um, this could go up. It can come down. Fortunately, it's it's chosen to come. It's it's found a path of least resistance here. Um, that tooth's got to come out. We've got to drain this infection. Uh, this this is most likely not life. It's not life threatening at this point, but it easily could be. Okay, this can turn turn really bad really quickly. Okay, go ahead. Okay, eh, kind of dark, you can't really see it. Here, big bubble showing up out here. So again, a tooth up in here that's starting to, to get infected. It can't drain through the tooth. It has to find another path to go. And so it's gonna come out into the cheek. Okay, right. okay. Um, another thing we're gonna talk about a little bit. So, so we're talking about the, the infections and the abscesses that, that, that spread and you know how that process. 
even just gum disease though, can be really significant to your overall health. So even though this is not life-threatening from a dental standpoint, you're not going to get an abscess. You might get a small abscess, but you're not going to get an abscess. It's, you're not going to get a brain abscess from this. But you, there, there are issues. And so even this is, is a factor. So just to, so chronic inflammation, whether it's gum, gum disease is one of the most common because gum disease doesn't generally hurt. And so people think, eh, it's not hurting. I'm not going to do anything about it. Um, been related linked to heart disease, decreased immune response. I see this all the, all the time that as your body is fighting in one area, then you've got, you're more susceptible to problems other places. Uh, I, I'll have patients come in that have abscesses all over the place and they have symptoms very, very similar to chronic fatigue. They're just worn out because their body is fighting infection all the, all the time. Uh, joint disease has been linked to that and more severe infection sequelae. We're gonna talk about, uh, about that. So, next. So kind of, I don't wanna to get too, too technical, but just but really important. More and more, and this, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of information on a huge area of, of study. And these, the cytokines. Cytokines, it's, it's a, a communication system in the body, just like the nervous system sends impulses. This, th these, are, these are chemical messengers and it, they can be good and they can be bad, but, but how, these, how this communication affects different areas varies. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So it's a, it's a way for different cells to tell different parts of the body basically what's going on. Okay, so good cytokines will, will stimulate or reduce the immune system. Okay, they can stimulate or they can reduce the immune system. Uh, they they uh, function like growth factors. They work a lot of times like um, similar to some, some hormones. They, uh, in bad cases, they can increase immune responses. So if you have other things going on like arthritis, or asthma, Crohn's disease, anything. So basically, inflammation, as, as, as it builds up, it sends out these, in, these cytokines to other areas, and that can trigger good responses or bad responses. As you start to get a lot of this building up, then you can have cytokine storm, which can be deadly. That's uh, toxic shock syndrome, uh, DIC disseminating intravascular coagulation. That's where some areas of the blood are, are clotting and other areas won't clot. And so you're getting blood clots in some places that are causing strokes and heart attacks and you're getting other places that won't stop bleeding and extremely, extremely dangerous. And what, so these things are caused when you start to get, it's like a domino effect. When you get inflammation on top of inflammation on top of inflammation. So you have some inflammation, chronic inflammation in your mouth. You maybe have a little bit of arthritis. Maybe you have a little bit of, of abdominal issues. You know, maybe you have a, uh, some type of a skin inflammatory response. And all of these things start to come together. And maybe you have just a few of those. And then you have something that's a big deal that hits you, like a, a, a staph infection with toxic shock syndrome. Um, and that creates the, the, the DIC, where these... It, it, in, this can create a situation where your chance of survival is anywhere from 50% to 15% and sometimes lower. And, and so it builds up. That's actually one of the things that we're seeing with COVID is COVID is, will take several different areas of infl inflammation, people that have health issues that are not, that they're managing, but this, adds all of that together and adds a little bit more and pushes them over the top. You had a question? I was thinking in an emergency situation, if all of a sudden we don't have, we're, we're kind of hating now. <laughs> uh, how do we prevent these things from happening to us? What kind of diet should people be on? Uh, yeah. What should we be doing that? So that's where, that's where we're going with this. So right now I'm kind of presenting, this is the problem. Okay, these are the things that we're looking at. It's not just the abscesses. It's not just the infections. It's also the inflammation. It's the things that just 
tax our bodies all the time. Um, you know, uh, with Fred, we we're talking a little bit about balance and how balance it all fits together, and and problems generate other problems. And so, so something as small as kind of a chronic gum disease can actually turn out to be a really big thing if, if especially if uh, if care is not is not immediately available. So now we're going to kind of go into a little bit more of what you're asking about. Okay, first of all. Prevention, 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 prevention. So we're going to talk a lot about that. I realize this is like basic dental stuff 101, but you know, I, I, I bet that even though we're going to be talking about pretty basic stuff, I bet that I'm going to present some things that you may not already know. So hopefully it'll be useful for you. Okay, so toothbrush. Um, I would say, now, my, my opinion, because I deal with the failures. I deal with when the the home care the dentistry and all that doesn't work i'm the end of the line um, toothbrushes are great we definitely want you to use a toothbrush uh, if you have a regular toothbrush i would very strongly recommend that you throw it away and get a sonic toothbrush now uh, get the sonic toothbrush first and then throw away the, the toothbrush okay so Sonic is a style, not a brand. There are several different brands. Uh, this is a Philips and Sonic. I like it because it's kind of, it's not as rattly as some of them. Most of them tell you, use this for two weeks before you throw it away because it kind of tickles and you think, ah, there's no way I can tolerate that. Yeah, you just push through it and you get used to it. And, but these, they're gentler on the teeth. They'll clean better, just like if you take jewelry and you take it to a jewelry store and they're going to put it in a sonic cleaner because that cleans, they don't brush it off of the brush, they put it in a sonic cleaner. And so that's what these do. You you kind of brush with it, but really what you're doing is just putting it in place so it's more gentle with the tissue and it will clean deeper than any than you can do with a toothbrush. And so as far as home care, I strongly recommend a some type of sonic toothbrush. Now, another really important thing. Studies have shown that toothbrushing is a very complex memorized movement, which means we do the same thing every time, especially if we're in a hurry, which means we brush the same places and we miss the same places every single time. So it really doesn't matter. I don't care. You don't need to brush your teeth five times a day. Twice is good, okay? In the morning when you get up, because you just really should. And at night before you go to bed, because at night our mouths dry out, we breathe through our mouths a lot, and the saliva decreases. And so the, the acids that are created by the bacteria are concentrated. So you, your, your very best effort should be before you go to bed because that's your highest risk time, okay? People with dry mouth, you've got to really, really, really be meticulous. So, so the key is, this is a memorized movement. Make it a good memorized movement, which means take the time. Like It's like with anything else. If you're going to play the piano, you don't sit down and see how fast you can do it. You're, you, you plan it out, you do it that way, each surface all the way around, take, you spend two minutes doing it, it's not like it's gonna take hours, you spend two minutes doing it, and you make sure you get all surfaces, okay? So take the time to learn a habit of thorough, uh, thorough brushing, okay? Uh, these are absolutely wonderful. Um, so a sonic toothbrush and a water pick, are the, that is the A1 combination, okay? A water pick will get places that nothing else will get, okay? If you have any slight pocketing, floss is okay for getting the contact points, but floss is a straight line this way. You can bend it around the tooth this way, but it's a straight line up and down. If you have any dip or groove, it's not getting in there, and neither will the bristles, even with the Sonic. A water pick will get there. Um, I really like these in the, the shower floss ones. These, uh, you, can, you can get them on Amazon. They're like $30. They're cheap. You put it in your shower. So you take the shower head off, put the valve on, and put the shower head back on. So his water picks, almost everybody's got a water pick. Almost nobody ever uses them, okay? Because it takes time and you make a mess and all of that. These, you're just taking a little bit longer shower, 
And so it's a, it's a good excuse. Um, but what you're doing with the water pick is you're hunting for places that you are missing, which means you're trying to, you're going down into the gums. You're not going to do damage. What I always tell patients, you're not going to do any damage with the water pick, no matter how high, high you have it turned up, because there's nothing you can do with this water pick that is going to be anywhere close to what I'm going to do with a scalpel. Okay. So if you need me to clean it out, it's going to be with a scalpel. If you can clean it out, do it with the water pick. Okay. And so what you're trying to do is find a place that hurts. And when you find that place, that means that nothing else is getting there and you just work it. No pain, no gain. And for about three days, you're going to say, uh, oh, that guy didn't know what he was talking about. It is hurts. It's not getting any better. It's just like when you dig a piece of uh, popcorn husk out of your gums and then it hurts for about three days. The tooth feels loose and everything. It's going to feel lousy for about three days and then it starts to heal and you blast up in there and you know you're in the same place, but it doesn't hurt anymore. Then you know you're getting to the right place and you're, you're covering your bases. Okay, so floss is good, but only really for the contact points. The rest of it, you're going to need a water pick. Okay, tongue scrapers are great. Uh, this is Breath RX, and again, you can order those. These little, you know, kind of gentle picks are good. Uh, floss, again, these little flossers or whatever are nice, but none of that takes the place of a sonic toothbrush or a water pick. So, so prevention wise, that's kind of your mainstay. So, okay, let's go into this. Okay, uh, talk a little bit about toothpaste. Uh, the toothpaste uh, ads always show this huge amount of toothpaste on there. You don't need very much. Toothpaste, uh, that's something you just want to store. I, I know there are things out there of, well, you can use this, you know, the, the oh, what is it, the charcoal and all different things. Just use toothpaste, but store some. It lasts a long time. I know there's an expiration date on there. I know that expiration date means nothing. Uh, we did a, a study when I was in dental school. I helped with a study, and they were they were looking at that. And the, the toothpaste was fine after ten years past its you know past its date. Maybe the fluoride wasn't as good. Yeah, it's, that's just fine. So so store the basic necessities so you're not out trying to grind up you know uh, what was it charcoal or something to to brush with um, so uh, you don't need a lot with as far as toothpaste especially so use toothpaste that is very smooth don't use toothpaste that is gritty don't use uh, um, baking soda Okay, baking soda is, is gritty. And I've seen people literally cut through the teeth where the teeth broke off. You look at it and it looks like they had a little mini hatchet at the base of that. You'll, they'll actually notch clear into the inner layers of the, of the tooth and then it breaks off. Be, and they've done that with a toothbrush. They're scrubbing like crazy. Okay, they're still missing all the same places. Okay but and using using uh, materials that that are gritty any toothpaste that is whitening is going to be gritty you can use that for a little while if you want to do a little whitening but it whitens by sanding okay so now you take this toothpaste sandpaper and you put it on a sonic toothbrush now you have a power sander okay and and literally you can do significant damage to to the necks of the teeth in a very difficult location to fix, just getting overzealous and, and not brushing correctly. Okay, so soft, soft toothpaste that when you rub it in your fingers does not feel gritty. Okay, or if you finish brushing and it kind of feels like, God, I kind of have sand, almost like I have sand in there, then you know, short term to whiten your teeth a little bit and then get rid of it and use something else. So if you're going to stock up, stock up on the stuff that is soft because you're not going to care about whether you're whitening or not you're going to care about whether you're damaging or not okay so uh good smooth toothpaste okay next all right so things to look at i'm going to spend a little bit of time here because really uh, this is this is a lot of i think really the crux of it is what you need to recognize what you need to know how to to look for so gum pain if, if, if the gums are sore and inflamed, 
you need to do something about it because of the chronic inflammation issue, but also because that, that can lead to, to bigger issues. Most of the time, it's just gonna be that you need to get your teeth cleaned, okay? And then after you get them cleaned, then start a really good regimen of being very meticulous. You, you go home, you say, okay, he said, to, you know, be really careful and you do that, but there's a lot of this tartar, the calculus buildup on the teeth. You're not gonna get that off with a toothbrush. It harbors a ton of bacteria. You, you need to get rid of that first. So you kind of get a new clean start, okay? So real important to go in, get a good clean start, get the gums healthy, and then any place that's painful, really work that with the with the water pick if it doesn't respond if you go four or five days and it's still hurting there's more going on than just cleaning out a pocket and you've got to go get it got you got to get it checked because something's going you know something's deeper than what you're managing okay obviously cracks and breaks and you know i just broke this tooth off uh you know those those are things that if it doesn't hurt it may not be serious but pain is not always a reliable, especially with a fracture, because it, that infection can drain back through that fracture. And so often a broken tooth won't hurt. And so that's, that's something where you want to, you, you want to be sure that it's, that it's healthy, that you don't have, uh, I, at least every day and probably multiple, we have a 3D x-ray. A 3D x-ray, you, you can't hide from a 3D x-ray. Um, and we'll see abscesses hiding behind the roots, up into the sinus where you can't see them. They have just had x-rays at their dentist and they saw nothing. And we get a 3D and sure enough, they've got three or four abscesses going on. Yeah. 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 And that's just it. You, pain is not, is not a reliable, it's, it's pretty reliable at telling you that there is something wrong, but the lack of it is not a reliable way of telling you that there isn't something wrong. Okay, tooth pain. So here, really, really important. I'll try. So, so there's what's called reversible and irreversible pulpitis. Pulpitis is just inflammation of the nerve of the tooth. So when a tooth nerve starts to die, if it's reversible. That means, okay, you, you go back to that picture where the cavity is starting to get down into the tooth, but isn't close enough to the nerve yet to kill it, enough to start to tweak it a little bit. Okay, so reversible typically will hurt when there's a cause. So, and usually not biting on it. It's usually cold, maybe hot, but it's usually gonna be you eat something cold or something sweet and that will trigger it. Okay, maybe a tap on it, but that's a little bit less, you know, you can't really tell as, as much, but it, it'll, it'll kind of zing you, but it won't last more than maybe a, a, a couple of minutes, you know, it lets you know it's there, but it, it doesn't continue to hurt. And it hurts when there's something has happened with it, okay? Then it's almost always going to be reversible, which means it probably just needs a filling, just needs to get the cavity out, fill that in, and you're not going to have any other issues with it. Irreversible is when it just starts to hurt on its own, just out of the blue. You, you didn't, you, you didn't eat anything. You didn't pound on it. Just starts to throb. If it throbs more than ten minutes, it's almost always going to be irreversible. If it wakes you up in the middle of the night, it's definitely irreversible. In that situation, you're going to need to have a root canal, or you're going to need to have the tooth removed. Okay, it's, it's, it's not going to be fixable with a, with, and, and, and if it goes away, so if it's doing that and then it goes away, that's not a good sign. Okay, that doesn't mean it just got better. That means it's releasing that pressure somewhere. So either it, it, it may be slow enough that you don't notice it, but you're, you're pushing infection into your bloodstream or your sinus or your neck or wherever it happens to be going, but it's going somewhere. All right, uh, drainage. If you notice, you know, a gum boil or swelling, that's the infection, that's the path of least resistance. So that means it's, it's draining. It's not gonna go away. Antibiotics won't take care of it. It's, it's not gonna go away until the, the, either the tooth has a root canal or it's, or it's removed. So once a tooth, once it's a dead tooth 
or irreversible, those are your only two options left. So the goal is to get to them before you need any of that. But if you, you know, if you see a draining fistula, a gum boil, that's not something you want to, it's, it's going to get, it's going to get worse and it, it will not go away. It may stay that way for you for years, but then it just gets, it gets bigger really slowly. It won't actually heal. Uh, obviously, if the tooth is getting loose, that tells you something's definitely going on. Something's pushing it around. Uh, if it's painful to tap on or bite on, it's usually either fractured or or it's got or it's got it's a dead tooth. It's or a dying tooth because generally sometimes it can just be that you're grinding on it and you're, you've made it sensitive, or it can be an infection in the gums, and then it's gonna you'll blast it out with your water pick and it'll get better in three days. If it doesn't get better in three days and it stays sensitive, it's not a gum infection, it's a tooth infection. And that's, you know, that's one that you don't want to be the guy going off, you know, for FedEx, ending up on the, <laughs> on the, the island uh, with his tooth. On that, I, I think it's, it's always kind of funny that the endodontist that did his root canal that failed is also the guy that ends up marrying his girlfriend in the end. So just <laughs> isn't right. I don't know. All right. So, okay. Again, don't think it's all right. If the pain, if the pain goes away, that can actually be more worrisome. Okay. Okay. So, and we're going to get into a little bit more of, of things you can do, but really, most people really have very little idea of what their dental condition is until something really rears its head. And so, so knowing about your own treatment, knowing what's there, knowing what you have had done and making your own decisions is, is important. We're gonna talk a little bit about the materials. I think it's important that people know for themselves what the materials are, what the issues are with those materials and, and make your choice based on you know based on those things um the quality of the dental work it's interesting that even in you know in how do i put this it's dentists know that people don't know what the dental work looks like they know how they treat you but you generally don't know the quality of that dental work unless you know what to look for. And it's very different. I, I, see, I, I see the failed cases and I'll show you a few of what I'll see that is gonna fail and things that I see that just will not fail. And, and it comes down, the biggest factor is the quality of the dental work. The second biggest factor is the quality of the home care. And you can control both, but you have to be able to, to look at both. You have to be able to take the time to actually look at the dental work that you've had done and that you're having done and make a de determination from that. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Know, know your risks. What are the kinds of things that if you see that you think, I, I better get that taken care of because that's gonna be a bigger problem later. And we've talked a little bit about, about that. The, the, the draining fistulas, the, the, the painful teeth, the loose teeth, the, the bleeding gums. Your gums should not bleed. If there's any place that your gums are bleeding, you, that again, that's water pick territory. That's where you really want to work it. Now, let me add one other thing as far as water pick. I love the shower picks because they are, the shower floss, because they are easy and they're immediately available and so people actually use them. The regular water picks that have a tank, they do have a really good use. And that is if the other just isn't really working, okay? It's still kind of staying sore. You've gotten your teeth clean, so it isn't that, and they're still just staying sore. If you, if you are getting a lot of infections in the gums, you can, and I know this is chemical and it sounds terrible, but you take one teaspoon of bleach and add it to 16 ounces. You're chlorinating it like a pool. Uh, you only want to do that for, you know, it's, it's, it's enough where you taste it, but it's not enough to, you know, it's, it's considered a safe range, but you're killing the bacteria. With the water pick, you're debreeding, but it doesn't kill the bacteria. You're just trying to wash it away. If that's not working, you can do that. Get in there and really blast it out. 
and, and that will usually get rid of it if anything can. So as far as home care, a water pick that you can uh, add, that you can add water to is good. Okay, uh, key phrases. Things that if you hear the dentist say, other than just, oops, that doesn't look very good or something like that, kind of obvious, um, that make you want to think twice about it, okay? Uh, one thing is crown lengthening, okay? They say, oh, we can put a crown on this, but we're going to need to do some crown lengthening. What that means is that there's not enough of the tooth for them to get a hold of and put the crown on, okay? So they're gonna have to remove bone around the tooth in order to get down onto the root so they can put a crown on it. But the gums are still the same place, and so you're creating a pocket. You're creating something that's gonna be very difficult to clean, okay? And that's a last, last ditch effort with a tooth. Now, I'm not saying not, you know, to automatically not do it, but be aware. Be aware that if they say crown lengthening, that triggers in your mind, okay, this tooth is on its last leg. So I can have them go ahead and fix it, but I need to realize that this tooth is very likely a ticking time bomb, okay? They're, they're in the realm of what I call dental heroics, okay? Uh, so crown lengthening is, is one of those. Um, another one, uh, uh, post and core means again, there's not enough of the tooth to put a crown on. And so they're going to create enough of the tooth to put a crown on that can work, but just realize that it's, it's not as strong. The chances of that tooth failing are much higher. And so just, just being aware of that. Um, so, uh, anyway, I'll think this more as we go. Uh, so root canals or implants. Uh, I send a lot of patients off to get root canals. I realize there's a lot of controversy with that. The biggest issue with root canals, and I'm just going to be straight up with you, the biggest issue with root canals is who's doing it. Okay? And that's not my opinion. That is, that's, that's known insurance company statistics. The days of the dentist that can do everything are long gone. The specialties are so much more complex. Nobody can learn all of that. Uh, modern day, now, root canals, and I don't do root canals. I'm not talking about me. Again, I don't have a, I, I don't have a dog in this fight. But I see what works and what doesn't. And the insurance companies, they keep closer eyes on that than anybody. And, and now... When you go to an endodontist and they do a root canal, they're going to do that under a microscope. Okay, the general dentists aren't going to have that seventy-five thousand dollar piece of equipment to do the root canals. They're going to do it, you know, just by hand. And the success rate of root canals done by dentists does, is is much lower. It just is. Okay, you're dealing with a, a specialist that does the same thing day after day. They have the top equipment. Your the chances of that root canal being successful is far better if it's done by an endodontist than if it's been done by a general dentist. And that's just the, that's the, the known facts of it, okay? Um, root canals work. If there's enough tooth there to, to really fix, you don't wanna do a root canal in a tooth that you can't really put a crown on, you know? So they say, well, we can do a root canal and we can do some crown lengthening and we can do a post and core buildup. It's time, you know, it's, it's uh, cold steel and sunshine. Grab the tooth, gold steel, sunshine on the roots, and, and uh, you know, you can replace it with an implant or you cannot replace it or whatever, you, you know, whatever you want. But there, there comes a time when you just aren't going to fix that tooth, okay? And, and it is good for you to have a feel for when that, you know, know what to listen for. Uh, you know, we may be able to save this tooth with root canal. All this, no, maybe, may be able. Probably is not the words you really want to want to hear. Okay, uh, specialist or general? Again, what how, what's the complexity of what you're having having done? So, okay, be ask questions. Be willing to ask questions. Be willing to put them on the spot. And and you know, it's your mouth. It's your health. Be willing to ask questions. Be willing to look for, for uh, second or third opinions. I always encourage people, get as many opinions as, you, as it takes for you to be comfortable with the treatment you're getting. 
that it's 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 a good idea to be well informed and well educated on your on your own treatment. Okay. Any questions? Any of that? Okay. Now, this is this is the next step up. This is if you really want to you you want to take care of your dental health in the way that you should take care of your medical health. That means really pay attention and keep a log. Okay. And, and I have patients that come in and they've got their little log there and they'll say, and first of all, they learn the numbers, okay? So, so if this is, if you're looking in the mirror, it's gonna look backwards to you, okay? But if I'm facing you, upper right is one, that's the wisdom tooth. So this is your wisdom tooth, goes on around to the upper back wisdom tooth is 16 over here. Now you can always look it up, you know, and then you drop straight down is 17 and then on around to 32. So eight and nine are the front teeth and you know, we really like these in the front. We don't like to go without those very likely. Okay, so, so and they'll, they'll keep a log and they'll say, I had this filling done by this person at this time or this, this tooth has been doing this and this tooth has been doing that. And so they're educated. They know this tooth's kind of been a little bit of a problem, but you cleaned it and it felt better. And, you know, so they, they come in and these patients come in and they say, yeah, tooth number 30 has been really bothering me. And it, it has on and off ever since I had that root canal. It just hasn't felt right. And, you know, can you take a look at it? And so they know what's going on and they know which tooth it is. Otherwise they come in and say, something was hurting. I don't remember if it was here or here or over here or something. I remember it kept me up a couple of nights and then, you know, so, so if you really want to keep track of your and, and be a participant, it is really helpful to, to keep track. Where do you have crowns? Where do you have, where did the dentist say, Ooh, that's getting really deep. I hope that doesn't start to bother you. Okay. Which tooth was that? That's really good information to, to know. All right, because if you're starting to look for problems and we don't have x-rays, okay, now we're back to Haiti. I have to, most of the time, it's simple. I look in there, it's a big black hole and, and in that tooth, and that tooth's coming out, and that's all I need to know, other than once the tooth is out, then I can see if there's an infection or abscess down in there, and I can dig that out and be done with it. But, you know, we don't get away with that here you've got crowns and things that the tooth looks fine under. I look at it, it looks good. It's a crown. What's going on underneath it without x-rays, your input would be really important of saying, yeah, I, I have had some trouble. It's this tooth right here, you know, or it's tooth number four. And then I know exactly where to look and I know what is most likely going to be the cause of, of what's of your, your problem. So, Anyway, so this is, this is you know, advanced self-care, but it's, it's the best way to keep track of what, what you need. Okay. All right. So we're coming back to this. We're going to talk a little bit about materials. Now, I just want to point out, and I, to me, I don't really, you know, you can use whatever you want. There are pros and cons. This is a marketing slide. Okay, these are really ugly. Okay, the this if if now I don't people come and say, well, who's who does really good work? It's really difficult for me to say because I don't know. So so this person is coming into my office and they're being sent over from you know Dr. A and and I, you know, it looks like this. I say, that's beautiful work. And I look at that and I say, oh man, that's terrible. Well, I don't know if that dentist did any of this work. You know, they, this may have been done by dentist B 20 years ago. I have no, I, I have no idea. So, but you do, you just went in, you just had that filling. You paid attention to which tooth it was. They said, we're going to put a filling in tooth number three. And so you write down tooth number three and you get home and you look in the mirror and you say, dang, that looks pretty good, okay? Where you say, whoa, that, I, I, we always, we, we'd refer to it as thumbprint fillings. I mean, you stick the filling material in there, squash it down with your thumb, you leave your thumbprint, and you call it good, okay? You know, that's not good. That's bad dentistry, 
So, so learn how to look at what's there. And, and it was brand new, it was just done. What does it look like? Okay. You're not gonna know all of it, but some things you'll, you'll be able to tell. Now in this marketing slide, they've taken really bad and compared it with, this is a really nice job. But now this doesn't tell me what's going on underneath this. They can leak more, much more easily. So it's, you know, uh, amalgam is as bad as it looks. It seals itself over time. These teeth are actually far more likely to leak and maybe cause problems in the end than possibly these are. It depends on what's going on underneath them. There's more to the, to the story than, than just that. In Haiti, we're going to lean towards doing this unless we're in an area where there's a clinic that they can come back to if they start to leak or we have better equipment. We can actually use air and water and do it the way that it's supposed to. Then this is great. But if we're in a, we have no suction, we have no air water, we, we, you know, uh, we have no electricity or minimal, then this is probably, we're just going to make them look a lot better than this. But that's the, you know, that's, again, pros and cons of the material. Okay, go on to the next one. Okay, I'm going to just talk about the, some of the controversies here. So I, I, I know all the stuff with the, so uh, amalgam fillings. It has mercury in it. We don't like that. Um, a lot of studies is patients with certain autoimmune and allergic diseases, such as systemic lupus. Mold. So this is, this is the composite of a whole bunch of study, a whole bunch of, now, is it the end? No, there's no such thing as the, as the, the end all to any question, but this is a lot of study going in as kind of the compilation of what they're finding. And the finding is autoimmune, allergic diseases, systemic lupus, multiple sclerosis, autoimmune thyroiditis, atopic eczema. They often show increased lymphocyte stimulation. So more, more inflammation going on, more uh, problems in the body caused by low doses of the mercury that are there. Um, most of these patients, they'll often report clinical metal hypersensitivity, especially to nickel, meaning like they can't wear cheap earrings they'll, that will make their ears flare up, uh, you know, their ears flare up. It's the nickel that, that is in it. There's also nickel in the, in the amalgam fillings. Okay. So yes, there are a lot of situations where that isn't, you know, people that have these sensitivities, it's, you, you don't want to take something you're allergic to and stick it in your body. And, and some people are allergic to the metal in crowns. And so we can run into different, different issues that way. However, if you don't fit all of these things, you'll probably do just fine with amalgam fillings, you know, but just removing them all is considered to be a bad idea because it's very difficult to do without having a huge spike in your, in your mercury level after having them removed. Now, there are ways to try to minimize that, but even with very, very meticulous protocol, it's really difficult to remove a bunch of amalgam fillings without getting more mercury in your system than you had at the beginning. Now, that's talking about, do you remove them and replace them? If they're broken, they're leaking, and they're not working absolutely. If they're not, then the recommendations are don't remove them just because they're amalgam unless you can do it, have it done in a very careful way. And even then they usually see a spike in the mercury. So you may be defeating the purpose in trying to remove them. And then you have to ask yourself, what are you going to put back in its place? Let's go to the next one. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to just paraphrase this for you. Bis GMA based resins in dentistry. This is the nice tooth, tooth colored ones. Okay. These are highly implicated in the hormonal cancers. And so there is some concern that these real pretty white colored fillings may not be all that safe. Now here again, a compilation of a lot of research saying that in, so in, in a nutshell, uh, so what they're looking about is, is that these can induce changes in estrogen sensitive organs. Okay. You're talking about hormonal estrogen based cancers. Um, the, so the rest of this says, we looked at all this in, 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 in short term, it doesn't cause any problems, it's safe, okay? The problem is, and they even say that more study needs to be done in long term. 
hormonal situations are long-term. A short-term safety study is not going to answer the questions for what happens year after year after year. So these things are still unknown. They're still out there. I don't throw that out to say, whoa, be afraid of it. I mean, you, you've got to make your choices and it's better, it's your mouth, it's your teeth, you need to be educated. Um, if I was allergic or had any of the things that, that put me at risk for amalgam, absolutely I wouldn't have amalgam fillings placed, okay? If, you know, if, if you're really at risk and concerned with some of the hormone, maybe that's, you know, that's in your family and things like that. Maybe that's not the best direction you go. I don't know. Those questions have not been answered. They're still out there. And I'm sure not answering them for you tonight, but I think it's important for you to realize that, that those, those um, issues are there. Okay. So these are some beautiful fillings. These are silver. These are your amalgam fillings. Now you look at the difference between these. You can see the difference between these versus the other ones that I showed you. Okay. These are works of art. This is done by somebody who cares. They spent the time. They made it look nice. You look at these. Nothing's getting in there. That is sealed. That, those will probably never leak. Those fillings will probably last this person's lifetime. Okay. Very good work. Well done. If they're tolerating the material, sure, I want to take those out and put something else in unless they're not tolerating the material. Okay, this is learn to recognize what really good work looks like. It looks like a tooth, it's just different color, nice, smooth, well polished. The dentist took time to, to, to do the details. Okay, if they took the time on the outside, they probably took the time on the inside as well. Okay, go to the next one. I wish I had a better picture of these, but these are gorgeous. These are, these are gold. That is still, that is, that, the, the problem is it's almost a lost art. These fillings have been in there for about, he said about 50 years. They are still absolutely perfect. They don't leak. They, they don't corrode. They last, if they're well done, they last forever i mean so but it's hard to find anyone to do it it's kind of a lost art the you know the expense and the lab and the time and everything is is difficult but you know again you you look at even whether even if these were amalgam or even if these are are tooth colored you want to see that they took some time with it okay that it looks like a tooth if they took time on the outside they probably took time to do a good job on the inside so Take the time to look in your own mouth and see what it looks like and, and find a dentist that, you, that you, you trust. You see that they do good work and you feel like they're, they're going to take good care of you. Okay. All right. So some things that you can have around that may actually do you some good. Um, most of it, you're, you're, you're not going to do your own major dental work. I mean, you're, you're back to, the, you're, you're back to the, the skate and the rock at that point. But... A, a mirror to be able to see what is what is this brand new feeling that I just had done? What does it look like? Or have your husband or wife look at it or something and and make your log. It, this was done by so and so, and it looked it's nice and shiny, nice edges. I don't. It's not all. Doesn't look like it's you know corroding and falling apart. And it just they just put it in. You know, it may not be super shiny right at the beginning because it has to actually set for a little bit, and then they'll they'll kind of rebuff it. But it it, it looks like they spent some time on it. They wanted it to look nice. Okay. Um, so to be able to look for things, look at you know, is there an area that's draining? Is there a red spot? Is there something that's going on? Uh, mirrors are very useful. This little pick, you want to be, it's called an explorer. You want to be kind of careful with that, but you want to know what's going on underneath the crown? Take that and just gently stick it under the crown. If you feel tooth, that's good. If you feel nothing and it goes into a big hole, that's not good. Okay. Whether it hurts or not, that's a tooth that you need to go have somebody take a look at. So you don't want to be jabbing the gums, okay? I'm just saying just gently feel around. You're going to know. You jab yourself. You'll know. You won't do it more than once. And then just kind of work your way around and, and just see. Is it how, especially if there's the gums are getting really, are starting to hurt and they're hurting around that crown, just kind of check around a little bit. If it drops in and there's nothing there, you've got a big, you've got a problem. There's a big hole under that. That's why the gums are starting to act up. 
Um, this is, so um, I call it a hockey stick. It's actually called a plastic forming instrument. If you're going to make up a little, a little temporary, you know, you can get them at the, at the, the pharmacy or the store, you know, the little temporary filling material, you've got a tooth, it's got a hole in it, it's really bugging you, you're going to stuff this down in there. That's okay as a very short term thing, because what are you doing? You're plugging the hole. Where is the infection going to drain through? Through the hole. You're plugging that. Where can it go? The only place it can go is the opposite direction at this point. So you don't want to do that and leave it. You know, the tooth was hurting. I stuck this stuff in it. It feels better. I'm good to go. I just perform my own dental work. I even smoothed it out. The edges look pretty good. I looked at it in the mirror and I think I did a dang good job. You know, and no, it doesn't work that way. You're, you're creating a bigger problem than you had in the first place. Now, you may, it may work short term in taking some of the irritation off of the nerve. But anyway, so this is an instrument that you could kind of stick some stuff down in there and maybe make it feel a little bit better. Okay. Uh, little tweezers, you can take some, and I'll show you, you know, some, some eugenol, which is like oil of cloves, and you can take a little tiny piece of cotton and dip it in there and stick it down in the hole. You know, it's the middle of the night and it's starting to bug you and you can put a little bit of that in it. And that, it's, it's a topical anesthetic and that can work really well. So that's something you can definitely use. This is a, this is a curette that, you know, if, if something's kind of caught in there, you can maybe get, get it out. But again, you're, you're, you're not going to be doing your own dental work, but you could, you could do a little bit of help. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, eugenol and aspirin, great short term topical anesthetic. Okay. This is what we use for dry sockets. So somebody has a tooth pulled and they get an, a dry socket and it's really achy. We take some crushed aspirin, we mix it with some eugenol, we stick it down in there. Uh, the body tolerates it really well. We don't have to dig it back out. It just dissolves and it makes it feel better. So you've got that tooth, you just bit down and it broke and there's kind of a hole in it and it's really hurting and it's middle of the night and you know nobody's gonna be in, uh, but you'd really like to get some sleep. Probably one of the safest things you could do is grind up a little bit of aspirin, put a little bit of eugenol, make a, a paste in it with it. You grab it with your little tweezers and you stick it down in the hole and you, you push it in. You don't want to get it all around because aspirin is an acid and so it, you don't want to put it on the gums. If you do, you'll do it once because you'll see that the gums are going to turn all white. It'll burn them. Okay, You'll burn the gums with the, with the aspirin. So you don't want to get aspirin all over. You know, don't just chew on the aspirin and figure that's going to pack it down in there because it's going to get it all over and it's going to hurt. And, and then the gums will be just as painful as the tooth is. But you can make some eugenol and stick it down in there. And, and that could very likely get you through the night, but it's not going to fix the problem. Okay, it's not, it's, it's not going to go away. Um, one thing is a sideline. Don't use hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide, never, under any circumstances, I don't care what it is, has any use in the mouth. Hydrogen peroxide more than any other material has been linked to mouth cancer. It actually burns the edges. So, so when I do surgery and I really carefully try to get the, the, the gum edges together so they'll heal really nicely. And then they, the patient uh, rinses with hydrogen peroxide, even diluted, and they come back in and those, those, the gum edges are all just red and rolling back. Okay, it's very caustic. To, to gum tissue. So hydrogen peroxide is not used in the mouth. You can mild salt water, about a half a teaspoon in a glass of water, great. That, that's soothing, it's safe, uh, has some antibiotic uh, ability with the salt. Um, you know, that's great. Hydrogen peroxide, no, that's out. Okay, go to the next. Okay, um, IRM. So this is this is one of those paste kind of materials, and you can get variations of it. You know, the 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 tooth remedy stuff, and you just make a little make a little ball of it, and you you stick it up into the hole, and that may get you you know may get you through the day. Um, it just it, it's just to 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 cover it so that cold and and sweet and things like that aren't getting in there. Might buy you a little bit of time. Okay. All right, uh, so this is this this takes the place of the of the the rock and the skate. Okay, uh, so they, they look almost identical, but they are not. This is a one fifty, and this is a one fifty one. Okay, 
And so if, if, you were, if, if you were going to have anything, okay, you're not gonna know how to use these and you're gonna do, so dentists that have been practicing for many years send patients to me to take the tooth out because it's difficult especially in our society where it's not like Haiti, where I'm getting a tooth that has had nothing done to it. They've had root canals, they've had fillings, they've had crown lengthenings, they've had crowns, they've had everything you can do to a tooth. And that, and I know it's gonna just crumble as soon, and I'm gonna to have to get out the drill, and I'm gonna to to cut it into pieces, and you know, and that's just, that's, that's every day, okay? Um, it's, it's not easy. And so, so it, it, I, I, I wouldn't recommend that you figure I've got the tools, I'm gonna do the job. But, but it's better than a skate with a rock, okay? And, and hopefully you can find somebody that has the knowledge but maybe just doesn't have the tools, okay? So, so these, you can take out almost any tooth with those two, uh, two forceps. Uh, I, I mean, it's I'm nice to have others. I don't know if I'm able to use this word, but my teeth are aching. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> all right. So now, of all of the things, if you can have, if if I was going to have one thing in my in 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 my storage. And I was a non-dentist. Well, and, and as a dentist, I, I keep at least a year's supply of lidocaine all the time. I tend to do that anyway. Uh, when, when COVID hit and nobody could get gloves, I had a year's supply of gloves. When nobody could get masks, I had enough N95 masks. I distributed them from Cedar City to Mesquite. We, I just... I, I do that because when you need them, you can't get them. And I always use them. We use it by the time it's expired. We rotate it. And so we, you know, we don't waste a lot. Every once in a while, we'll throw a case away, but most of the time. But, but of all the things you're going to want, you're going to want to have that tooth numb. Doesn't matter what I'm taking it out with. You're going to want it numb. So good question. It does not need to be in the carpules, okay? Veterinary, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Um, probably, if you're, if you, if you're determined enough, you can probably get some. Um, it's you. It is not to use on yourself. Lidocaine is dangerous. Lidocaine is an emergency heart drug, okay? Uh, you can overdose on it. You can give yourself all kinds of problems. People have died from giving themselves too much lidocaine. Okay, so if you're going to store something like that, you are storing it for somebody that to, to use that knows how to use it that may not have any. Okay, it it can be dangerous. You have to be careful that you're not injecting it into a vessel because that can make their heart just absolutely go nuts. And anybody that's ever had that, where you're sitting in the dental chair and all of a sudden it feels like your heart is Clying, it's clawing its way out of your chest. That's from the epinephrine that is in with the lidocaine. Okay. Ideally, we typically use lidocaine with a under 100,000 epinephrine. There are times you don't use that. There, are, you know, there. It, it's. It, I am not telling you start doing your own dentistry. But if you're looking at okay, I really, really, really want to have something in case something happens. Well, that'd be a good one to look for because. You are not going to want to see me or anybody else showing up with my, you know, I've, I've got the forceps, I am ready to go. I ran out of lidocaine, so I don't have any of that. No. Can we teach this crowd at least how to turn off the nerves in the mouth without any painkiller? I, I would be fine with that. Can now, I yeah. I a few seconds, because yep. I've had root canals and everything else with no anesthetic. And I haven't had any dental work done in 60 years since I learned that I was sensitive to it with anesthetic. Put your fingers, lace them together like this. Let me get word. Let me make sure I'm on camera. Yes, we are. <laughs> I'm not screen shared. Lace them together, push them together enough so you can feel that push. Hold that 15 minutes before the tooth is pulled and you will not feel that tooth being pulled. 
I've had teeth pulled with that. I've had root canals done with that. I've had all my dental work done with that and no pain, zero, zero pain. So I'm just saying it because if we're in an emergency situation and you don't have lidocaine, you can turn off the nerves in the mouth. Can you still feel things? Yes, you can feel pressure, you can feel movement, you just don't feel the pain. Just for the mouth or is it the rest of the body? Could they just the mouth. Them? This is the tips of your fingers are your mouth. So and I I do have I do have patients that for different reasons cannot use local anesthetic and most of the time we put them to sleep and sometimes they can't even do that and they can get through it but it's not you know and when you're dealing with a tooth that is really infected you're dealing with something that's going to that's that's going to be really painful if you can take care of it that way absolutely whatever works works but but it's really nice to not have to, you know, bite the, what bite was the, the movie? Bullet. Bite the bullet, you know, uh, and, and, and try to get it taken care of. Um, just a, maybe a question for, I have a root canal once where I guess the infection was so bad that my had to get rid of it. So you could, it would have made it anti pain stuff in there. So I had to suffer through root canal, perhaps to the chair or to the things. Yeah, that is a real thing. Um, about 25% of the time, if you have a really hot tooth, we are not going to be able to get it numb. That's what I call, that's time for better living through pharmacology. That's when we put them to sleep, take the tooth out. They don't go through all the pain. If, you know, if this works for you and all that, I, I'm not trained in that. I'm trained in we get the tooth numb or we, get, we put you to sleep. Um, you know, an, an emergency situation, the tooth's got to come out. It's, it can be very likely life and death. You, you, it needs to come out. Um, uh, having, having options, having ways of making that achievable without being miserable is definitely desirable. So however, you know, is if whatever works for you, try this, try that, whatever, whatever works for you, make sure that it's going to work before, beforehand. If you're going to do this, I would say, try it with your dentist. Say, hey, I want to try this. And if that works great for you, then wonderful. Okay. If it doesn't work for you, then you know that you, you know, you may want to look at another option or talk to Fred about what you were doing wrong. But, but look at, you know, but really the time of the emergency is not the time to be trying to figure this out. Okay, so you need to decide how you want your dental work to be done and make your plan. Okay, and, and, and whether that is you're going to have lidocaine or whatever it is, but make sure it works for you before you're, you're in that situation. Because yes, when it's, in a, when, when it's a bad infection, all bets are off. Okay, other than going to sleep. That works. Okay, go to the next Okay, um, this is this is uh, this is medical grade super glue is what this is. Now, what makes it medical grade? It's sterilized. Okay, so the super glue in the grocery store, it's not sterilized. Does it work the same way? Yes, it does. Are you going to get an infection from it? Probably not, but who knows? You know, I can't legally use it. I, I don't pick up you know grocery store. Uh, th this stuff. This is really, really, really expensive, you can imagine. Um, but you know, that, that purple tint that they put in it to tell you that it's medical grade, that's probably really, really expensive stuff. You know, it's some type of purple food coloring that, you know, that, that drives this up to, you know, $100 a bottle or something, or and maybe more than that. Anyway, very useful in the right circumstances. Um, a, a, a small cut, even on the gums, just dry it out, put a little bit, and, and super glue, we use that a lot. There's, you know, for just small little things. If muscles are pulling it open, super glue is not gonna work. But, you know, if it's just, if it's real deep and you're into the muscles, super glue is not gonna work. It was just a little tiny, and, and you can kind of set it together and it sort of stays there. Super glue might work just fine, especially if that's the only option in town, you know. Then, then you can make some use of that. Um, 
there is a story that I have to add, have to tell. It's it's an obligatory story because it involves somebody that I really really like and admire, and 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 that is true. I really do like and admire him, but it's one of those stories you just have to tell. A a, a dentist friend that does not live here in town um, had his his daughter got a little cut on her lip, and so he decided super glue. I can I can handle that, and so. He, he kind of set the edges together and it fit together pretty nicely. And he, he got his, you know, over from the grocery store, super glue, and he kind of squeezes it. And it, you know, he, he had it in his, in his drawer. And so he gets it out and he kind of squeezes it and it's not coming out and he squeezes it and it's not coming out. And all of a sudden, <laughs> and he emptied this whole thing of super glue up her nose. <laughs> and yes. And so, so then he has to go to his really close friend, who I'm sure tells this story probably more often than I do, who was an ENT doc, who had to then take her to surgery and in, under general anesthetic had to go in and cut this big old stellate clump of, of super glue into little pieces and pick it out. So it's not perfectly safe. Be careful. Don't squeeze it up somebody's nose. Um, but but for little things, it, it is it is useful and it's it is safe. Test your bottle before you test your bottle. Don't don't just keep squeezing harder. Anyway, so lesson learned. Okay, let's go to the next one. All right, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about dental trauma situations now. Some of these slides are a little graphic. These in, in my world, so I, I teach a three-hour uh, class for EMTs and and uh, paramedics on uh, head and neck trauma, and it gets pretty graphic. I've got some pretty good pretty good slides. These are about as mild as my slides get. But if you're really squeamish, you may kind of you know you, you may want to. If it's going to bother you, then anyway, that's the warning. Okay. So, trauma. All right, injury. So we're looking at injuries to the now traumatic injuries to the teeth and the bones, the gums around it, and and what you can do, what to look for, what needs to be done. Okay. All right. So this just shows how a tooth sits in the bone. This is called the alveolar process. That's the part of the bone that holds the tooth. This is the root. This just shows the blood vessels that come in here and the 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 ligaments. Teeth are not connected to bone. Teeth are not directly to bone. Teeth are held to bone with ligaments. So there's a little tiny bit of movement there. Okay. So that's these little tiny fibers, these little ligaments. Okay. When it's torn, then it'll bleed up into there. Uh, so this is basically normal. That's what you should see in a side view of the front tooth. Okay. Now, so here a tooth has been knocked out. The bone is still intact. The tooth is out here. The, the, the vessels are obviously torn and the the fibers and the gingival the gum fibers are all torn but they're still there it even kind of kind of looks fuzzy there um, what we're going to do with this is we're going to stick it right back in the hole is the best thing for you to do with it okay now if you're not sure that it may be broken you're, you look in there and there isn't a real clean hole and you're not sure even what to do with it Put it in some milk. If it's somebody that is old enough that they're not going to swallow it, you can hold it on your tongue. You need to keep it moist. You don't want to put it in just water because that will soak the, the nutrients out of it. It'd be better to put it in milk, something that has, has a little bit more nutrients. But in the socket is the best place to put it. You just stick it in there and you have them hold it there. And you call me and we get them in and we put braces on and we hook it back into where it needs to be. And especially with younger patients, the chances of this regenerating is actually really high. They might need a root canal in it, but that's a different situation for a root canal. You're not doing a root canal in a tooth that is otherwise bombed out. You're doing a root canal in a tooth that is otherwise perfect. And the chances of that being successful are quite high. But time is important. That tooth needs to be back in a good spot within about an hour. Or the chances of it taking the way down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Can and it's deceiving. You can you you the the lips are still in place. Maybe look a little torn. You look underneath and everything's gone. So lips cover up a lot of stuff. All right, so put it back in. 
Now, let's see, did we skip one or is that the next one? Yeah, okay. So this is a, so, uh, this is a, a, a kid knocked these three teeth out. They looked all over, found them in the dirt, um, which that's fine. They, and, and they did a really nice job just cleaning them out, squeaky clean. These are useless at this point. They, because they, as they cleaned all of it off, you want to run it underwater, get all the dirt off of it, but you don't want to scrub them because think of those little, the other half of those little ligaments. Ligaments will heal to ligaments, but ligaments, a, a half a ligament will not heal to a tooth root. And so I can sure stick them back in there, but these nicely, absolutely polished roots are never going to heal. There is, there is no hope for those teeth. So you want to rinse them off, but don't scrub them. Okay? We need those little, what looks kind of like hair you know, or tissue stuck to the roots. That's important. That's what's going to keep the tooth in there. Okay, go to the next one. Okay, so if you're looking at this, that's a pretty, the, the bone looks okay. It's a little swollen. That tooth, you've got the tooth, it's intact. Maybe the, the part of the crown is broken, but the root looks like it's intact. Stick it right back up in there and hold it in and, and you know, let them put it in themselves if they need to, because it's a little, little tender and you just kind of push it in. That's the best place to have it, if you can keep it there. If not, keep it on your tongue, as long as you're not gonna swallow it or stick it in some milk. Okay, so we stick the tooth right back in, go on to the next one. Uh, we can bond it, put some some uh, bonding material in there. Now, by bonding, I, I don't mean it's not like, you know, Gorilla Glue or something, although yeah, that might get you there. But, uh, you know, this is this is orthodontic. Really, what I do is I'll put braces on. So they have braces all the way across the front here, and that holds that tooth in place. And it'll very likely do just fine. But the sooner it's back in place, the better it's survival. Okay. So this shows, a, so now this shows a tooth that has been pushed. It hasn't come out all the way, but it's pushed back. Okay, so go to the next. Okay, so that's, this is the schematic for this. So, so it's stretched here, it's pushed out. They try to bite down and they can't bite down. Okay, then what we're going to do is just pop that tooth right back into place. Now, if you can do that yourself, it was just a matter of pop it right back in, especially if it's down and back, you can often just pop it right back in. If not, if you try and it's just not going, don't force it, okay? Because it's something else is going on, and I'll show you. But, but if it'll just pop back in, pop back in, it's still gonna need to be stabilized, but you've got it in the right place. The chance of that to surviving just went up significantly because it's back in the right place, okay? How long does it take to heal something like that? Oh, about 10 days. Okay, so go to the next one. So here you've got a tooth that's broken off, if this is, is, what you're gonna to wanna to do with this is leave it alone. Leave it alone yourself. Obviously you need to go in and get it taken care of, but there's nothing you're gonna do with that. You're not gonna pull it down. The, the pieces, if you have them, they might be slightly useful, usually not. Um, I wouldn't dig through the dirt for them. If you happen to find them, then fine, bring them in. Most of the time we're just gonna say, oh, thanks, and throw it away and, and you know, fix the tooth from there. But but you, you don't, you're not going to try and get a hold of this and pull it down or straighten it or anything like that. You're not going to help. All you're going to do is further loosen it. So if it's out of the way and when you bite down, you're not hitting it, leave it alone and let us deal with it when, you know, because that's we, very likely, like right here, you see this is a split. That's telling me that the bone is attached to this outer, outer uh, surface of this tooth. And if you mess with it, you're going to lose the bone. And so we're gonna actually work with that very carefully so that we can preserve the bone on the outside surface of that tooth. So, so when I'm telling you kind of pop it back into place, that's only if you really have to because you can't bite down with it and, and, you know, and, and it'll pop in pretty easily. If it's broken off or anything like that, you just wanna leave it alone. Okay. All right, so this shows a situation where the tooth is pushed up and back. If you try and push that out, it's not going to go in because the tip of the root is out. This is what I'm talking about where see this, this outer shell of bone is attached to the tooth. So what we have to do actually is with this, this is my other finger and I'm pushing down on this tooth to get it past this eminence and then I can pop it in and then I need to, I need to support it. Otherwise that bone is going to go away and so is the tooth as well. So there are times if it doesn't nicely, fairly easily pop back into place, don't mess with it. 
you got it either either way we're going to need to get it back in place but the sooner you can get it in the right place if you can do it the better the the survival potential is for that too okay. uh this now this shows two teeth that are together but push back okay it looks really bad on the on the 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 picture but this actually isn't as bad let's go to the next one this is an alveolar fracture so it's broken through the bone that sounds worse but it isn't because bone heals to bone really nicely much better than bone heals to tooth and even better than ligament heals to ligament and so if you if this tooth just pops back in place and i put braces on and we stabilize it this bone will heal the, the chance of this tooth surviving is much higher than if it's a lone tooth all by itself kind of floating around so even though that seems a lot a lot worse i wiggle this tooth and both teeth move and wow that's really bad not really it's actually better than a tooth by itself in most cases so so that you could probably gently just kind of pop it back into place and you come in if if it will go easily if it isn't, doesn't go easily okay this is advanced stuff this is there is nothing going on there's you you've got a broken jaw it's in between the teeth and there is no help around you can do what's what's called a bridal wire you want to go two teeth though not one tooth you put a wire around here and a wire in between and you just little tiny tiny wire and you very carefully just you don't want it super tight because as you tighten too much what's going to happen is you're going to open the bottom just enough so that now they can swallow without it moving they can talk without it moving and you can get get them to help don't do that unless there is nothing else that can be done this is not going to fix their fracture in a situation there was nobody else around and no opportunity you're by yourself on the deserted island that might save your life Go to the next. This is what we're actually going to do. So we're going to wire their teeth together. That's our equivalent of putting on a on a, a cast. Or go to the next one. Or we're going to put a plate on. You can see the fracture line right there, and and that'll hold the bone ends together. So I mean that that needs to be fixed right. I am absolutely not telling you, Cal, you just fell and broke your jaw. Just wire a couple of teeth together, and it'll be good. But but that's if you're way out in the boonies and you're it's going to take you a long time and you know that's it's it, it's better than the the you know some the was it the bandage wrapped around your head you know so if you can do that that will at least hold it in place but that's the most aggressive you should ever really be with with a fracture and that's absolute um no other options uh, things to try so okay in a nutshell things to go through Good oral hy hygiene, good oral hy uh, home care to avoid infection and eliminate inflammation. Just increase your overall body health by being very meticulous with how you take care of your own teeth. Uh, take responsibility. So pay attention to what your dental work looks like. What are your problem teeth? Why are they problem teeth? What are the teeth that you've been told this one's on its last leg? So you know what are, you, what are your risk spots? Okay, uh, know what to look for and when is it serious? Is this, is this likely reversible and you're probably just gonna need a filling or is this irreversible and it's time to get in and get it done before it gets, before it turns into something much bigger. Uh, basic home care necessities, you're, you know, store the toothpaste and the, and the, the, the toothbrush heads and, and store some regular toothbrushes because if you can't charge the, the one, it's not gonna be as useful, okay? So, uh, you know, huge null, aspirin, maybe some super glue, maybe some lidocaine if you want, or things like that are reasonable to, to have around. You're not going to, I mean, it, it, dental work is complicated. It's not something you're, you know, you're, you're really going to be able to do a lot, but some materials may be useful when materials are impossible to get. Uh, consider some basic supplies for temporary treatment. Again, maybe, you know, something to stick in a filling or, you know, if the filling breaks, just to kind of get you by until you can get in, but, uh, but temporary. Try to be better than the skate in the rock. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, just uh, with, with uh, Haiti, uh, you want any information? on uh, the, the trips that we take and things like that. The organization is called sianfons.org. Uh, I know I've been to Haiti with everybody. It's a very small organization. There's a handful of people that run it, 
Um, they do the schools. I know everybody there. I've been to Haiti with every single person that's, that's in it. Nobody gets paid. It's, it's a great organization. Um, I've taken people to Haiti that are non-professionals. They, we need, we need people to, to help move people and all that just as much as we need any, anything else. It's a great experience. The concern though is I don't know when we're going to be able to go back. Right now, the between the, the the COVID is an issue there, but the 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 political unrest is we haven't been able to go for the last two years because 2019 it was too dangerous. We we have a big organization in Haiti, you know, relative. I mean, they they take good care of us. We're we they know where we can be and where we can't, and so we've been there in you know sketchy situations, and we're we're we stay safe, but. Um, when, when the Haitians that run the organ, the Haitian side of the organization say, you cannot come here, we cannot go there. It's, it's, it's scary. So, you know, who knows, uh, if anybody is interested in an experience like that, um, we do take people, if you're willing to go and help and be a part of it and, you know, or even to the orphanages and we're going out to the out, outside of the cities. We're out in the, the places where there are no other options. And so it is a, it's, it's a life-changing experience. It's, it's something that you will not experience any, any place else. Do they take donations on there? They do. Like, will it work yep. with it, it, it does actually. So the thing that we that helps is that we have we have a there there are a couple of the the main Haitian organizers down there that that can travel to to Florida, and so we can't mail things to Haiti. It will it never gets to where it's it's being sent to, but we can mail it to Florida. Uh, I do that with, so since I can't go down, then we, we fund, there are a couple of dentists there that, that are part of the organization, they're Haitian, and they can go, but they have no resources. And so we'll send the equipment, you know, send the, the, well, I've left equipment there over the years. So they have everything there that they need except for the supplies. And so we send supplies down. Yep, they're still, so one of the schools is in full swing still. They're up in the, you know, up in the mountain and, and they, they're still fully functional. Um, the organization educates about a thousand kids a year. Um, this school, I think is about 400 of them. Uh, the other, uh, there's the other main school is, is temporarily shut down because of the violence. There's, they're, they're a little closer to the city and, and it's just, it's too dangerous for them to have the kids there right now. So it's temporarily closed down. Um, but but the, the organization is, is, is still very much up and running. Um, nobody, nobody gets paid. It's, it's all 100% volunteer. And, and it's, it's, it, it's, it's a good organization. The, Annie's done a fantastic job for a long, long time. So anyway, so right, if you're you know interested in that or even just interested in seeing some of the, you know, they it hasn't been updated for a couple of years because just things are the 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 schools are or the one school is still going. Uh, they're still sending the dentist and the, and a, a doctor and some nurses to to all of the schools, um, and. Um, you know, they're, they're still, they're still supporting the teachers, even though they're not there, they'll still, they're still keeping them going. So anyway, so any information that's where it's from. So, and any questions and, you know, that, that'd be a fun subject at some point because it's, um, they say a lot of, a lot of experiences, a lot of miracles, a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting uh, things. And, going to Haiti for almost 20 years. So, um, Thank you. Last one. That's it. Okay. Any questions? I guess I should say that. Uh -huh.